Allah being the heart of the mu'min, is that the best example we can find of Allah's guidance? Or is there something better? That is to say, the Qur'an al kareem says all the best examples are for Allah. Allah says in the Qur'an, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, and we sent down the Qur'an on your heart, O Muhammad. Is there any heart better than the heart of Muhammad? No. So is it the heart of Abu Hanifa that we're talking about that is meant in the eye of the Qur'an? Is it the heart of, uh, you know, Hussein Nashid? Is it the heart of anyone in this congregation, the heart of a mu'min? No. We can agree that the best of examples belong to Allah because the Qur'an says so. So either the Qur'an here is saying the example of Allah's guidance is either Rasulullah himself or the heart of Rasulullah. And according to the Shia of Ahlul Bayt, we say that this ayah is only talking about the following individuals. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The likeness of Allah's guidance is a lantern in a niche. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's the first thing. A flame is Amir al Mu'mineen. SubhanAllah. Protected by a celestial, by a glass that is like a celestial star. Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Allah. The product of this lantern is a tree that is blessed. La Sharqiyya wa la Qarbiyya. Shajaratun. Mubarakah, one of the names that Allah specifically reserved of nine names for Fatima to Zahra is Mubarakah. Shajaratun Mubarakah. She emits, this tree emits or produces an oil that people can benefit from. It will provide them with light whether there is the existence of a spark or the non-existence of a spark. Which means the guidance provided by this tree is not conditional, it is unconditional. Subhanallah. What did Rasulullah say about Imam Hassan and Hussein? Al Hassan wal Hussein Imama Qama aw qada. Hassan and Hussein are your Imams, whether they rise or whether they sit and do nothing. They are your Imams. There is no condition on their Imama. There is no condition on the Nur, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, whether there is an existence of a spark or there is no existence of a spark, this light will still give you Hidayah. It will still give you guidance. In the same way that Allah has used the Nur to speak of himself, we speak of the nur of Ahlul Bayt in order to better understand Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because without them, we cannot understand Rasulullah. The Muslim world is something around about almost 1.8 billion population maybe. Something like that. I don't know. Let's say we're not exaggerating. Let's say it's 1 billion. But we're told that a third of the world subscribes to the religion of Islam. Of that third of the world, I want to ask you a question and you can go to the books. Of a third of that world believes 80% of them subscribe to an ideology that says Rasulullah was not infallible. Rasulullah is a person who used to forget and a person who used to make mistakes. Okay. So do they know Rasulullah or do they not know Rasulullah? Because you see, I ask the following question. Christians believe in God. They don't believe in a different God to us. They believe in the very same God as us, exact same God. But we tell ourselves we believe different to them and they believe different to us based on what? Based on one minute difference. They say that God can have a son, we say God cannot have a son. You would think it's a very petty thing, right? But it changes the whole notion. So now do we believe in the same God or do we believe in different gods? We believe in different gods. When you come forward and you say Rasulullah was a man who was not perfect or Rasulullah was an individual who could make a mistake, do we believe in the same Rasulullah or do we believe in different Rasulullah? Is the same Jesus the same son of Mary? But you say he is the son of God and we say he's a prophet. Do we believe in the same Jesus? 
Is our understanding of, the Je of this Jesus the same? Is our approach and respect and reverence towards him the same? Or is it different? Completely different, worlds apart. Just because the name of the individual is the same, the values that you put to that individual are different. When you say that Rasulullah is not masoom, and Rasulullah can make mistakes, and Rasulullah can commit a sin, then we're not talking about the same Rasulullah. We're not talking about the same Rasulullah. When your Bukhari comes forward and says, Na'udhu Billah, that Rasulullah would urinate while he stands, and you tell your children in the masjid, do not urinate while you stand, then that is not a Rasul of Allah. When you are teaching your children when, that once they go to the washroom, they should not face or give their back to the Qibla, and your Bukhari comes and says that Rasulullah would answer the call of nature by facing the Qibla, and everybody else is shocked, then that is not a Rasul of Allah. When you as a man do not accept it for yourself, that a person comes and says, I saw this man and his wife showing affection, but your Bukhari says that people saw how Rasulullah was affectionate with Aisha. I don't accept that for Rasulullah. So yes, we speak about Rasulullah, but you would never know it because you believe in a different Rasulullah than the one that we believe in. You believe in a Rasulullah who would run around carrying his wife on his back. Let me ask you, realistically. Realistically. I'm not a Maulana. I'm a person who took the time to read and study his history, yes. But I haven't been to Hawza. But Alhamdulillah, we have a mutual respect. Me or anyone in this community right now, if you saw them running outside with their wife on their back, we're not in Medina now. We're in the West where everything is acceptable. What would you think of that individual carrying his wife and running and she makes him like a mule? Now the Billah. What would you think of that man? His prestige. Didn't Allah say in the Quran Karim Bismillah Rahman Rahim Qad Kana Lakum fi Rasulullahi Uswatun Hasana Fatabiru? Did Allah not say in Rasulullah is the best example? So everybody, it is wajib on you to follow in that example. Why is it that the Muslim world doesn't carry their wives on their backs and run down the street? Why do we need cars? Yeah. Only because she is the daughter of a Khalifa. You put down Rasulullah. If Rasulullah married her at such a young age and he passed away while she was still at such a young age, you know, where did this Romeo and Juliet love come from? What about Khadija alayhi salam Allah? Where's, where's her mention? The woman who gave all her wealth, where's her mention? Because you see, you say we love Rasulullah, but Rasulullah says, if you love me, then love my Ahlul Bayt. But you only love one wife, and that wife, do you love her? This is a very important point. Do you love that wife and respect her because she is the wife of Rasulullah or the daughter of your first Khalifa? Because you don't mention Umm Salama and neither do you mention Mary the Coptic. As a matter of fact, if I told you Mary the Coptic, majority of the people wouldn't know who she is. Right? Mary the Coptic is the wife of Rasulullah who Aisha Na'uzubillah accused her of adultery in their own books. The wife of Rasulullah accuses another wife of Rasulullah of adultery. Do you know why Aisha dislikes Ali ibn Abi Talib? Do you really want to know why Aisha dislikes Ali ibn Abi Talib? And the reason why she led a campaign against him is because she did not forget this incident that took place where Rasulullah had a child from Mary the Coptic, Ibrahim, who would later on pass away. And when this child was born, the wife of Rasulullah goes around and begins to spread rumors that Mary the Coptic, who was a Christian, became Muslim, was being unfaithful to Rasulullah. Na'udhu billah. Na'udhu billah. Wa alaykum And since she was being unfaithful to Rasulullah, Allah made her child die at a very young age to save Rasulullah the shame. And that community, let us not fool ourselves into thinking that it is a community that loved the Prophet. These were people who just yesterday were carrying arms against the Prophet. 
So people began to spread. They had very little respect for the Holy Prophet. They began to spread these rumors around. So in their own books, Tariq at Tabari, in at Tirmidhi, you will find in uh, Abu Hadid ibn, Had ibn al Hadid, you will find the following narration that Rasulullah went to Aisha and he said to her, O oh Aisha, I am going to send Ali to examine your claim. I'm warning you, I am sending Ali to go and examine your claim that my wife has committed adultery. Aisha, remember, I have never sent Ali on a mission and he came back as a failure, never. Whatever I send Ali for, Ali brings back only the truth. I didn't imagine that. If I want to tell you, and I'm saying to you, I'm sending Ali. Ali always brings me the truth. In inverted commas, I sent two people, one of them being your father, and he always comes back as a failure. Right. In Uhud, he abandoned me and ran away for three days. In Khaybar, he went and came back and he was sending Lana on your other friend. Each one calling the other one a coward. But I'm sending Ali. I'm not sending your father to examine the story. If I was sending your father, maybe you can have some confidence because the guy doesn't always come back with the right answers. But I'm sending Ali. She said, I don't care if you send Ali. So Rasulullah warned her a second time. He said, I am sending Ali. She said, I will not retract my statement in the community. He said, Ya Ali, go and bring me the truth of the matter. Obviously, if you're going to claim that Rasulullah's wife, Naudhu Billah, has committed adultery, you're going to need to find someone who you can accuse of committing adultery with. So Aisha accused Mary the Coptic of having an affair with one of the shepherds in the town. And shepherds at the time were bought. They don't own the flock. They're basically slaves working for somebody else. <coughs> so Amir al-Mu'mineen went looking for this particular shepherd who was accused. And when Amir al-Mu'mineen found this guy, now, you have to think and put yourself in the guy's shoes. Someone has falsely accused you of committing adultery with the Prophet's wife and you see Ali ibn Abi Talib walking towards you. What do you do? Oh, you run. You run? <laughs> How fast can you run is the question. <laughs> so this guy, you know, he sees Amir al-Mu'mineen coming to him. He runs up the tree. <laughs> True story. He runs up the tree. Amir al mumini says, come down, I'm taking you to Rasulullah. He says, no. Tell Rasulullah to come here, I'll talk to him from the top of the tree. <laughs> Amir al mumini said, come down. He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib, listen, I know who you are. And I know what sword you carry with you. You carry Dhul Fiqar. I'm a shepherd. This is no, it's not a fair fight. So go call Rasulullah. Amir al mumini said, and if I promised you that I will not fight you, would you come down? He said, yes. Your word is gold. So Amir al mumineen said, I promise you that I will not fight you. So this guy comes down. But, you know, imagine you just got attacked by a lion and the lion walked away. Are you normal or are you still weak in the knees and shaky? Still weak in the knees and shaky. This guy still being so nervous when he tried to come down from the tree, he stumbled and he fell. His trousers got caught in the branch. When his trousers got caught in the branch, his trousers came off. Amir al mumini said, this guy is not a man. He can't produce babies. He's castrated. So the Imam said, Put some sitter, cover yourself, take it, and I'm leaving. He went to Rasulullah, he said, Ya Rasulullah, that man is castrated, and if you want, send people to examine him. But there's no way that this man could have committed adultery with your wife. And even now, if he did, there's no way he can produce babies. He's castrated. 
So Rasulullah said, Ya Ali, say it to the community. Because no one's going to challenge Amir al Mu'mini when he says a word. And at that moment, she was found to be a liar against Rasulullah. And she carried that hatred in her heart until the battle of Al Jamal. And beyond the battle of Jamal, where Bukhari says, and when news of Ali's wafat reached Aisha, she fell on the ground in sujood to thank Allah and her state was the state of a person who had been forced away from their homeland and finally was allowed to return home. Do you know what that means? When you're allowed to return home, it means you reached what you wanted to achieve. So with all due respect, you may call the man by the same name, but this is not Shakespearean history arose by any other name would not smell as sweet. You may call him Muhammad Rasulullah, but you believe in a different Muhammad. You believe in a Muhammad who you care about him based on your companions and the children of the companions and their relation. Basically, this is how it works. I have a table and I have food on the table. And I only like this table because it holds my food in place for me. It keeps it high above the ground. You are more concerned with your companions and the daughters of the companions and the wives of the companions. And Rasulullah was a pedestal that holds them up in the society. But for us, we are different. We are only proud of Ali because Ali holds Muhammad up as a pedestal. We are only proud of Fatima to Zahra because she raised Rasulullah in her community. We are proud of Hussein in Karbala because he raised Rasulullah in his community. We are proud of Imam Zamana because he will raise Rasulullah. In his we don't love Ali because who Ali is. We love Ali because of what he did for Rasulullah that nobody else ever done. And I want to conclude on just one point. Put everything and everyone else aside, let's talk about the man himself. 80% of the world says Rasulullah is not masoom. He's not infallible. He's a man who could make mistakes. And in fact, if you follow Bukhari, he is a man who made mistakes. Bukhari has more than three narrations that I have read. The list quotes more than 15, but I only bothered to read three and I was like, that's enough. Because Islamically, you need three witnesses, right? More than 15 narrations, but three that I have read personally that say Rasulullah would forget ayat from the Quran and misread them. And at some times, either a woman would correct him, and at other times, either a Jew would correct him. Let me ask you a question. Put the man aside. Put the religion aside. Let me just ask you a question. Can anybody bring one hadith that says, the people saw Jibra'il speak to Rasulullah? Has anyone seen Jibra'il? There is no hadith in Sunni or Shia or even non-Muslim books. Not even the Christians and the Jews. There is no narration that anybody other than Rasulullah saw Jibra'il. Okay. So we haven't seen this Gabriel, this archangel. No one's seen him. Okay. Did anybody hear him? Did anybody hear his voice and confirms that what Rasulullah said Jibra'il told is actually what Jibra'il said? No. So, we have no one who saw Jibra'il, no one who heard Jibra'il. As a matter of fact, we don't even have anyone who knows someone that saw or heard Jibra'il. So if the Prophet that we are speaking of is a man who would make mistakes, and is a man who used to be fallible and forget, how do I know that he didn't forget what Jibra'il told him because I have nothing to verify. How do I even know Jibra'il does exist? What if the man's a liar? No? No, the Billah. But it's plausible. Isn't that what Orientalists say about Rasulullah? Orientalists say that we have no proof that Rasulullah was ever visited by Jibra'il. How do we know that the man didn't make up the religion himself? So, your Quran, your Salah, your Deen, everything 
falls apart the moment you doubt whether Rasulullah is fallible or infallible. The moment you say that Rasulullah is not infallible, then your Quran is not infallible. I don't have to follow it anymore. Then your Sharia falls apart. I don't need to be afraid of you anymore. So it is of the most importance that Rasulullah is infallible. Because that is the only thing that you have your religion based on is on the infallibility of Rasulullah and his Al-Bayt. The moment you say they're not infallible, then I'd rather go and worship a cow. Because I've never seen a cow make a mistake. A cow wakes up in the morning, it has to eat grass, so it eats grass. A cow wakes up in the morning, it has to produce milk, so it produces milk. And when a cow is killed, it makes a good steak, and it always makes a good steak. Has a cow ever made a mistake? No. So if your religion tells me that your holy personalities could make mistakes, and I look to another way of life, and it says to me a cow doesn't make a mistake, who is better to follow? So no, the Shia do not speak of Rasulullah. Because we don't need to speak of Rasulullah. We speak of the students of Rasulullah. And if the students, we can prove that they are of distinction, and that we can prove their infallibility, and we can prove that all that they did is good, then there is no doubt that Rasulullah is good. Because Allah, when Musa said to him, Oh God, show me yourself. Allah said, I will not show you myself. I will show you my nur. And if there is a fault in my nur, then there is a fault in me. But if there is no fault in my nur, then there is no fault in me. Here is Rasulullah. He showed us his nur. Ali, you and I are made of the same nur. If there is fault in Ali, there is fault in Muhammad. And if there is no fault in Ali, then there is absolutely no no fault in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he with the infallibility of Rasulullah he makes us infallible. With the asma of Rasulullah he protects us from all sin. And with the shafa of Rasulullah, may he forgive us all our past sins. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he sends the nur of Rasulullah, a nur which requires no condition for its authority. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send forth that nur so he can fulfill the world and establish it with justice, peace and equality. We also ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by the wasila of al-Habib al-Mustafa Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the following marhumin in this night in those whom he eradicates all their sins and gives them a home, neighboring the home of Rasulullah. Toba, Parvesh, Hassan, Husseini, Mansur, Khidri, Hawa, Husseini, Jalil, Husseini, and Khadija, Gulzar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept them in his infinite mercy. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala include our marhumin and your marhumin and the marhumin of the mu'mineen and the mu'minat especially those who are the sponsors of tonight's majlis may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make their graves into a garden of the gardens of Eden let us remember them with a surah al-mubarak tul-fatiha ma'as salawat do you have the name? Malika also uh, we just received news today that Nasheed Bai's auntie has passed away Malika Begum. So also please, if we can, namaz uh, Russia tonight um, after Maghrib Salah, inshallah. And also remember Surah Al-Mubarak Al-Fatiha. Salah Al-Nabi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad 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 Muhammad